terms. What are the major terms, especially? Because, you know, they are, these are Marxist Leninists, they think of the principal enemy, secondary enemy, well, you know these things. So, the Philippine China, China dispute should be first viewed in that context that the Philippines is trying to determine whether are the Chinese still to do, whether the Philippines is a friend, a friend or a foe. You know, these are revolutionaries. You know, the basic principle of re revolution, revolution is to know your friends and enemies. And then, you know, you ally with your friends and you force your enemy and you, you conduct all the, the United Front. That's the basic thing. Now, here comes the Philippines. At the time, bad timing actually, the dispute. At the time that there is now, in foreign policy term, effort to balance against the rising China, you know, up to the Afghan war, up to the uh, Iraq war, and all, the U.S. is like a pivot, you know, trying to refocus, rebalance to China, uh, to Asia. After 10 years of, you know, the Asia, but the China, the American Republic observed all these uh, wars in the Middle East and the Central Asia, revolt, they have finally recognized that China's rising and tried to balance against it. Here comes the Philippines really strengthening its relationship with the U.S., especially on the security field. You know, the, you know, the uh, mutual, you know, the visiting force agreement, more exercise and all that. And here comes the U.S. conducting its so-called smart power diplomacy, which essentially means that it, the U.S. recognizes it as no longer a dominating overwhelming superiority in, uh, in economic and military terms, but it has now have, it has to rely on alliances, other, other countries, so allies means Japan, Philippines, Australia, and all that, in order to help balance against rising China. So that's the context. So and given that larger picture, here we come, here we, here we are, claiming ownership and want to control the silence. The Chinese, again, would view this as an issue of whether by giving in or uh, defending their own, their own position, what is good for the security of the Communist Party? So regime sort of a legitimacy and eventually the, what is good for the security of China? That is the, the most important thing that has to be resolved. Uh, that we have to attack, so to speak, if we, are, if we want to achieve some breakthrough in our relationship with China and trying to finally find a solution to this island dispute. And I think that's where we are. Uh, the Chinese absolutely will not give in or take actions that will be prejudicial to their own security. That's, that's, that's a given. No, that's no brainer, right? So our challenge, of course, we have we have gone to the rules. Of course, we we know very well that uh, given the diplomatic history of China, they have never and never will, never in the, in the past and never will in the future, submit issues of sovereignty, security to international or foreign bodies. No, they never done. There is not in the history of the Communist Party. This it's basic, it's a no brainer again. That uh, that's so basic uh, in, in knowledge. And therefore, even if we are, of course, the court, the general court, submitting our claims, according under the Outlaws Treaty, you know, the, the Chinese will not play, the, will not play the, the tango, so to speak. You know, they, will, they will never, they will wait out the result of that. So we are in that situation. From our own national interest, maybe it's important to, to go to the court for our own uh, higher moral background, uh, for, to gain the moral high ground, for our propaganda to justify that we are a rules-based country, but it doesn't mean anything in terms of substantially uh, uh, advancing the process of, of, of trying to find a solution to this island dispute. We still have to go back to the basic principle. Are we friends or enemies? That is how the Chinese will view it. If we are friends, so basic <laughs> in the history. Of course, it's complicated, more complicated than that. We'll be experts, we'll debate how the borders are. But the basic principle first is, uh, and that is the most important for Chinese leaders, uh, Xi Jinping, all that, is the strategic situation, equation, so to speak. Whatever they do should enhance their security. Not we can obviously, the same in our, in our case, you know. That, so we have to resolve that. So that's where we are in terms of uh, the Philippines-China uh, dispute. 
that we are causing an impact and a kind of uh, uh, there's no way to move forward until we resolve that issue. And now, of course, the president, uh, our president, has tried backdoor diplomacy, but then uh, that altered and eventually became, you know, we were trying, he was trying, trying to find a solution to conduct diplomacy on many fronts. And that's exactly what we should be doing. Uh, because uh, whether we go back to the issue of the breakthrough, for example, the Nixon Kissinger diplomacy with China, uh, uh, it is sometimes a critical important points that. Normal challenge of diplomacy may not may may may, may, may be maintained, but in dealing with the communists, the communist party especially because it's a secretary party, they also you also have to open other options. So multi-track diplomacy, including uh, backdoor channel back channel diplomacy uh, conversation, are important, provided it's leading to the ultimate purpose of our diplomacy. Which is Again, <coughs> to defend our national interests, our own. We need those islands, and but again, the, the first question is: uh, we we can easily we. The lesson from the Soviet uh, Russia can, is that you have to find a way to find a compromise. That's all. I mean, it's uh, territorial disputes itself is zero sum game. But if you link it with other you know issue or linkages, so that the, the Chinese. If conceptually we can convince the Chinese that by giving up some of these islands and give it to us, it will enhance the security, I'm sure we will do something, we, we will achieve something. The, the Chinese gave in and reached a compromise with the Russian because, in the end, in their calculation, it will enhance their security. And how? They were able to demobilize a million troops from the border and concentrate on Taiwan because at that time, in the mid 90s, Taiwan was hitting up, you know. There was Taiwan's president trying to declare independence. China needed that. So, how to bring about this situation where we can tell the Chinese leadership, you give up some of these islands, cargo and all that, it will enhance your security. Not, not bring, that's the conceptual breakdown that we have to achieve as a country. How to bring that about? That's the challenge. Can it be done? I mean, it can be done because. From my point of view, a great country like China is really powerful, you know, but if you use the electrical pedal to take it, sometimes strength can be a source of weakness. While it's so, we, a small country, weakness can be a source of strength. Why? Because in this case, the Chinese, because it's just an ambition to get the Chinese dream to become a superpower, to speak. In, in, in the parlance, the ordinary conventional parlance, it wants to become the next superpower, at least equal superpower. It has a global ambition. Now, global ambition means vulnerability. So it needs security in its neighborhood. In order to become a rising power, it needs soft power, all these uh, dimensions of uh, great power status. It needs good relationship with neighbors. It needs all this, uh, it, has, it has to neutralize immediate threats. You know, they, they have the so-called first island chain, the strategy, and their defense. They need security from the, uh, the, uh, from the from South Korea, Japan, Taiwan, all the way to the first island chain, they call it. They need that security. So they need the Philippines. They need the friendship of the Philippines. But are we willing to get that friendship? That's another thing. Uh, so that's the point is, uh, first of all, we have to attack this most important strategic concerns of the Communist Party leadership. Before we can resolve, we can go to the details, the technicalities, experts can resolve that. You know, the continental show, the 200 man, we, the leaders don't go into that. They, they first go to, are we friends or enemies? We have to attack that in our diplomacy, especially in the light of this uh, New leadership that you know pursuing a China dream, a stronger China that cannot that if perceived to be weak or selling out national interests will fall down. They, they said so. If we lose Taiwan, the Communists will lose power. In the same way, maybe if they uh, they give in to the Japanese easily, that there will probably be massive demonstrations. You know, the, the, last year there was most massive anti-Japan protest. 
right? And that's a sign of the power of public opinion and the power of nationalism. Of course, nationalism is a cause of creation of the party. You know? Because after the collapse of the Soviet Union, Tiananmen Square massacre, and a little bit of a crisis of faith, uh, ideological crisis, no longer believing in Marxism, they had to uh, buttress nationalism as a platform for the unifying the country. But it's a double-edged sword. Um, the Communist Party, if the Communist Party is perceived to be not strong enough, that's why during the height of the anti-Japan protest last year, there were people holding the portraits of Mao Zedong. Why? Because Mao, to this day, is still perceived to be a strong leader who is willing to fight in the field of China was weak, was not afraid of facing up to the, <laughs> the foreign powers, so to speak. So it is a, an implicit criticism of the current leadership that they are weak, that they need to, to follow Mao. And all that. And they were, you know, you'd say, you'd think that Mao is no longer believing, and, you know, called him loose and discredited. But there are some aspects of him are still very much alive, especially on this nationalism issue. So, so again, going back to the Philippines, the Philippines, for all you, for you, as, as a matter of fact, if you read the social media in China and you know, even uh, newspapers, the Philippines is perceived to be the one bullying China. Bullying. <laughs> How can we allow the Philippines to bully us? That's the common thing. <laughs> So at the height of it, you know, where the, the re there was the banana trade and all that. It's, you would think that it's probably the Communist Party just manipulating it. But when I was at Walmart one day, at the height of it, oh, and I was with my Ch Chinese colleague, oh, they still have ban Philippine banana here. <laughs> I, I thought because there was the news. And then somebody, the attendant, a very ordinary attendant at Walmart, Oh, nah, that's the last one. No longer remember so long ago. He, he, he was, he was, uh, he was really saying, this banana will be no longer. We just let them rot, and then we will not sell Philippine banana anymore. It's, it's spontaneous. It's just an ordinary. That's how deep the uh, nationalistic, and maybe because the Chinese, after all, there's some they don't practice the freedom of the press information as we know it. You know. That's probably part of the reason why. But again, whether you like it or not, that's the reality that at the grassroots level there's a very nationalistic consciousness and trying to look, trying to judge the leadership whether they are good or not in defending national interest. In the case of the Philippines, of course, the island. So they, will, they always play up how the Philippines maltreated the Chinese fishermen. It's all on the documentary, you can see it. So, of course, the state media for state control. It probably passed up national even more, but that's the situation we're in. So you have to really attack that issue of whether the Philippines is the bully on behalf of America, so to speak. We have to attack that. We have to, uh, we, uh, we have to make them believe that we, are, we mean real friendship. But then, that's, <laughs> they have, we have to show it in action, in actual policy, that we are friends. Once we achieve a friendly context, a strategic understanding, and here comes diplomacy at the top level. Uh, the Chinese Communist Party are believe in top level diplomacy, not just, in, not just the foreign minister, but on very strategic issues. They need uh, a, what they call the strategic trust, really understand the key lead, almost on a personal level. Uh, that is lacking as well in Philippine China relations, the strategic trust between Aquino and, and the new leaders, for example. There's never been a style between the top. Because, however, the experts, the legal experts, the diplomats, the techni technical experts, the uh, experts from lawyers, you know, deal with all the details of this dispute, they will go nowhere until there is a strategic trust between the top leaders. And that's how the change from Nixon, is the, the opening of China. That's the lesson of it. You need a strategic Once there's an understanding, all the details can easily be. They came out with the communication, that came up with the compromise formula about Taiwan. They, they get it because the most important precondition of, uh, of strategic trust was achieved at the highest level. That's lacking in the case of Philippine diplomacy towards China.